So this morning, I, I want to begin by telling you, this message came about because of what I was watching on TV and on YouTube this week. You all know about the problem with the submersible, and when things happen in the sea and in the ocean, it just intrigues me. And I was listening to them talk about the five men in the submersible and, you know, their loss. And I listened several times and I heard, I don't even know how many people reflect on, you know, we need to be praying for these people. We need to be praying for these men or we need to be praying for their families or praying for the rescuers. And it came to mind to me. I wonder if they even know who they are praying to. I wonder if it is just words that they use that have no meaning, or if they truly know who we're praying to. So that's why the message is titled, What Does God Say When People Pray? I want to begin by looking at 1 Kings 18, and I'm just going to give you an overview of this. But we encounter the children of Israel who drifted away from what was a vital relationship with God. Their relationship was convenient, but not genuine. While they were in the wilderness, they had to depend on God. God provided them with food, with water. They couldn't have lived without him, and they grew to depend on him. Every day they would get up and they would pick up that day's supply of food, except for Friday when they picked up two days' supply of food. God provided. But then they reached Canaan, and they encountered a new lifestyle and a new, and I'm going to use the word God, but please understand, I'm using the word God with a little g, okay? They encountered the God Baal. A Canaanite fertility god. The locals taught them that if they worshipped Baal, they would have fertile wives, fertile livestock, fertile crops. This was essential for survival. I mean, okay, you have to eat. You're in the land now. God isn't providing every day. And it became real convenient for them to go, hey, you know what? We got this good. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll pray to Baal because, you know, we need, we need him to provide for us because that's what you say. And then, you know, on the weekend when we worship, well, we'll worship God too. They were providing for themselves, they thought, by taking some of this and some of that. If you think about it from just a worldly perspective, why, that almost makes sense from a worldly perspective. They had families to feed. They had a future to worry about. So they were doing what they thought was best for their financial needs, for their desires. But they also didn't want to ignore the God of their parents. So, you know, it's kind of like going through a cafeteria line. You ever do that like you go through the cafeteria at the hospital and you got, you know, you pick a little of this and a little of that and a little of this and a little of that and you put it all together and you got a meal? Well, they were doing that with faith. You know, we got, well, we got Baal here, so we'll grab a little bit of that, and we got God here, and we'll grab a little bit of that, and we'll put it all together, and it'll work out perfect. Except for one little thing. Baal couldn't do flat nothing for them, and God wasn't going to if they were going to be praying to Baal. Creates kind of a problem. Designer faith, if you want it, doesn't work. And that's, that's something they had to learn. But you know, it's something I think we need to think about also. 
we can't combine faithfulness to God with even the slightest little substitutions. We have no right to go to the only real God and say, you know, we appreciate everything you do for us. We love you to death, God, but, you know, a little bit of this over here isn't going to hurt, is it? You know, a little of materialism, it can't hurt us. Well, yeah, it can. It really can. A better thought, and I, I'm slightly off track here, but a better question might be, does God allow materialistic prayers? And the answer is no. It was problematic for the children of Israel. But it's also problematic for us. Look at Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Jump forward to Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Those are both fundamental teachings that the Israelites had to have known. They're also fundamental to our faith. You can have great conflicts when you try to combine faiths, to use that word. And I will tell you, I think it would be real hard to enjoy either one of them. It would be real hard to try to be faithful over here and try to be faithful over here. You've, you've heard the Bible verse, no man can serve two masters. Yeah. While striving to serve God, we can, if we're not careful, be brought down to the God of materialism, believing that a modern-day Baal can help us out. We can pray for an easier life. We can pray for wealth. We can pray for happiness without suffering. In amongst themselves, not always bad. No one gets up in the morning and says, God, today I'd like you to strike me with a disease. And if you do get up in the morning and say that, I'd really like to talk to you tomorrow morning. No one gets up and says that. We want to be healthy. We have every right to ask our God to bless us with health. We have every right to ask God to be with us when we're hurting. But our focus should not be on what makes it easier for me. Our focus should be on what is glorifying our God. Our attitude can get us wrong. We can sometimes, and I can remember talking to someone not too long ago about, we view God kind of as a genie. You know, we got the little lamp there. and We rub the lamp just right, we get what we want. You know, we pray just enough, we get exactly what we want. God's got to do it. Okay? Question. If you think about that, who's God? You or him? Then who gets to decide what we get? Not me. It's him. I'd like us to look at Elijah and what went on with him and look very briefly at how he challenges the people but then at his prayer too. See, Elijah had words for his generation, the people that we were talking about, those that went into Canaan. 1 Kings 18, 21. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. 
But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. I'd like you to notice, Elijah did not ask them, so who's giving you food? Elijah did not say to them, who has helped you with your personal decisions today? Elijah boiled it down to just very simply. Nothing to do with prosperity, nothing to do with happiness. Who is God? That's where he was at. And he says, how long will you be faltering between two opinions? Elijah's words could in so many ways be correct for many people today. For some will even call them Christians. How long will you falter between two opinions? We must choose our allegiance based not on how good you feel, not on how happy you are today, but on who is God. Period. Our motivation for following God is not well, who's going to get us into heaven? Who's going to make sure I got food today? But because he is God. Period. Explanation point. That should be our reason for following him. God does not say in this book, I will give you every desire of your heart. Because you know what? Occasionally, and I'll put my hands up for this, occasionally we can desire things that are not good for us. Don't know if any of you have ever experienced that, but occasionally we can desire things that are not good for us. The children of Israel had a prayer life that rendered them no power. It resulted in frustration. On the same level is the frustration of the prophets of Baal. Now, if you think about this, Elijah challenges them to a contest. Okay, We're going to see who God is right now. And the thing to remember is that Elijah at this point in time, he's standing up by himself. There are 450 prophets of Baal right there. And he challenges them to an all-or-nothing contest. We're going to see who God truly is right now. At the end of this, everyone would either call Elijah a fraud or a true prophet of God. A fraud, they would probably kill him. A true prophet of God, we're going to see. And the prophets of Baal, they accepted this challenge. They, they had no problem with this. The prophets of Baal were sincere. They knew what they believed. And I'm going to tell you, it is possible for a person to be sincerely wrong. They accepted this. They built their altar. They put the animal on it. And they started crying out to their God. They were ready. They were going to do what was going to bring down the fire of God first. So they had 450 people praying. They prayed from morning till noon. Nothing happened. They leaped about the altar, you know, and I imagine them prancing around and dancing and doing whatever, you know, they could do to entice their God. They cried aloud. They cut themselves repeatedly. They were sincere, but their prayer was useless. Their God did not respond and if you notice, the prophet of God mocked them. He was, he was not 
politically correct at this point in time. He mocked them. He called, I mean, he was just, well, not, not nice. It doesn't matter how many prayer partners you have praying or how long you pray, or how much noise you make, or how much you're willing to sacrifice. It's a helpless prayer when you pray to a false god. Elijah honored God. After Elijah prepared the altar, I'm going to tell you when you look at this, he closed all escape routes for himself. He, he was so positive. When you take and you build a fire with wood, you ever been out in the wilderness, build a fire with wood, and then to make sure it'll burn really good, you pour buckets of water on it before you start it on fire? Don't normally do that. Elijah went, I know who is God. And he built the altar, put the altar, and then covered everything with water. I mean, he covered it with so much water, the water was running out. And then, look with me at 1 Kings 18, 36 through 38, or 36 and 37, excuse me. And it came to pass at the time of the evening offering, the evening sacrifice, that Elijah prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, O hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have not turned your back, turned, that you have turned their backs to you again. After this short, humble prayer, and it's not really super deluxe prayer. God answers. Look at 1 Kings 18.38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Okay. From morning till noon, the prophets of Baal are screaming and yelling and trying to get their God, and nothing. And Elijah, with the faith of a man that says, I know who truly is God, prays, and rocks are burned up, and dust disappears, and water burns up, and the sacrifice, it's all gone. Could you just picture for just a moment Elijah standing there and watching this happen, watching the 450 prophets of Baal going, we might have made a mistake. Because they got nothing, and Elijah got the fire from God. Elijah got to hear the people worship the Lord. And then the false prophets died. That's the ending of that. That's as far as we're going there. How is your prayer life? Are we sometimes like the children of Israel? praying with selfish motives, praying the wrong prayers? Are we like the prophets of Baal, occasionally very, very sincere, but very wrong? Or are we like Elijah, faced with impossible odds and circumstances, boldly asking God to intervene? I pray that God will continue to send down his fire from heaven to ignite every one of us, to keep his ministries faithful and strong for him. What does God people 
What does God say when people pray? When Elijah prayed, God said yes. He, that's the answer. When you burn up everything, including rocks and dust, the answer is yes there. We may not always get a yes, but God will honor our prayers. We have a God that wants only what's best for us. He's not up there going, okay, now let's pick out, you know, what, what they can do with right now. We have a God who wants only the absolute best. When he gives, he doesn't give junk. He doesn't give second rate. Nothing comes from God stamped made somewhere other than heaven. We have a loving and giving God who does hear our prayers. I'd like you to look with me at James. James 5, 16 through 18. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Would we have the courage, and jumping back to Elijah there, if we're facing 450 prophets, would we have the courage to dump water on the altar? Do we know our God that well? Because see, Elijah didn't have a plan B. It was God or nothing. Because he knew who was God. Each one of us here knows who God is. I trust. Each one of us here knows the salvation provided by Christ. I hope. Each one of us here has a prayer life guided by the confidence that our God hears and knows. I pray. The prayers of a righteous person avail so much. I will not stand here and tell you that God will give you all your desires, but I will stand here and confidently tell you God hears your prayer, God answers your prayer, and God loves you enough to give you what you need. We are supposed to make plans. We are supposed to prepare and to work and to do things. If I came to church, come up here Monday morning and just sit in the front of the pews and don't do anything, God's probably not going to have birds deliver lunch for me like he has done in the past. Not for me, but for others in Scripture. He might, but I'm going to say probably not because he's going to look at me and go, oh, buddy, you're doing it wrong. But I know I have a God that answers and hears. And we should know who we are praying to. And we should know the God who says yes. I have every confidence that God wants to see all of us in heaven. I have every confidence in that. I pray that you want to see him in heaven and have made the choices that it takes to get there. We have the ability to speak to the King of glory. 
I'm not going to ask you if you've prayed today. I'm not going to ask you if you've prayed this week or this month. But if you haven't, you're missing out on access to the God who says, I love you enough. I'm even going to let you breathe real air today. We are closing singing song 361. That song is titled, Sweet Hour of Prayer. And I trust that you are praying to a sincere God. I trust that you are praying to the only real God. All three verses. We have a minute to think of Lloyd. To think of Lloyd? Yes, sir. Yeah, we, we will. Okay. We will. Um, the request was that we spend just a moment thinking of Lloyd. Um, now, he would be probably in surgery right now. So let's go to the Lord in prayer for just a minute, and then I will close. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship, to praise you, to speak to you. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness, your eternal faithfulness to us. We do ask that you would be with those who are caring for Lloyd at this time. We ask that you would be with each of us as we seek to be your people. Thank you for your love. In the name of Jesus, amen. Mm -hmm.